out of everybody in the world, that was like the last person you expect to get a call about. Jamal, like, oh, cause it's just not like that. You know, I thought he was okay. I didn't think something like this would happen at all. Nobody expected that. Nobody saw that coming. It was a situation that happened in about three days that we had no control over. That's how quick it escalated, period. I can't, and I don't know how, if I ever will be able to wrap my mind around it. It's, it's no making sense of it. Why? 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 When Jamal was born, it was uh, a happy and uh, fun day. The way he came out was like, where am I, you know? <laughs> so he had the entire room laugh and I was just so in love. I made the trip as soon as he arrived to uh, Louisiana. And then from there, about a year later, he came and visited me in this area, Chicago and stay with me. Um, I guess it might have been his first winter, you know. So those are my earliest memories. So uh, the first time I, I saw him, you know, it's just like this, this little guy, and I knew he was part of my family because the size of his head. So I was like, yeah, he's one of us. We were actually going down, me and my father, we were going down to move my sister from New Orleans back up to Chicago. Uh, I recall his first winter, the first time he saw snow. And I, I was amazed because I, I didn't know they were from the south. It didn't snow there. And he looked up and said, snow. My early memories of him were, were always good times, fun times. But uh, he was definitely a mama's boy. He, if, if his mother was around, party's over. He would gravitate to me so much that I was concerned he would ever have friends. <laughs> me and Jamal knew each other since we were five. So it's been about uh, 14 years. It started off as just friends when we were about three or four, and eventually we started calling each other best friends, and somewhere in there we started calling each other brother and sister. Uh, we went on a cruise together, and that was my favorite memory, because it was like, I really got to know him after that, and then after that, that's when we really started hanging out, because I found out he was an awesome dude. There was one summer where it was just, I was learning how to swim and Jamal was encouraging me to do it and he was just like making sure that I didn't give up because he knew that I could do it and I was just freaked out and he was always like a positive person, you know, encouraging me and I always think about that, how much he encouraged me to do stuff. You are one of the best people I've ever met, honestly. Get me like that. Should have been face a fact. Focus on the music, gotta focus on the stack. They stay trying to sleep, why are you trying to take a nap? Waiting for the text when my phone's in my lap. Waiting for the next, like I'm waiting for a cap. Bottle up the films like a bottle of a raps. Can't show the world, never let them see you saw the boys and the girls. She kept me in love, she didn't even tell the girls. Jamal was a very creative and talented and smart 
very smart uh, young man, very respectful, quiet, meek, um, just wonderful. And I'm not overstating it. I mean, really a wonderful, wonderful young man. The man was really talented at making music. Um, just the passion he put into it and the, the love he had for it. He was a very receptive child. Uh, he was very mannerable and he was uh, one who liked to learn. So at uh, my earliest understanding of anything in school, uh, he took it to heart and he really tried. He was one that always tried. Mm -hmm. He was one that wanted to be the A plus and so in anything he endeavored with, Jamal was always about making sure no one was disappointed, um, not being a failure in someone's uh, sight, and um, stand up to bar. For example, uh, Jamal asked me for uh, $5. He wanted to get something from the store. And I'm like, man, what is $5 going to do for you? You got to get gas. You got to do this. You, okay. So I gave him $20. He went and got all of his stuff and came and brought back the change. That's the kind of kid he is, right? He got what he needed, and he brought back what he didn't need. I met Jamal through an organization, Top Teams of America. The purpose of the organization is to help them develop into well-rounded individuals. And immediately, uh, Jamal's heart just came out. Whatever you asked him to do, whatever you needed, he did. He held several offices. He even made his way up to our top team president. Not only in our area or our community was he known, he was known throughout the entire Midwestern region as just an individual that just got it done. I'm very grateful that all the parents and uh, siblings and friends came out. I like the fact that Jamal has always been seen to have the same kind of keel as kind and loving. So that means that was internally how he was. I've never seen him yell. You know what it's like for somebody 13 to 15 years old that doesn't yell? Like I spent my whole, <laughs> my whole teenage years screaming. I know it's like cliche, like, oh man, this is such a good boy. Nah, not like this one though. In fact, he was such a good kid, I always tell people that if he wasn't my son, I would have still have loved him and liked him the same way. Jamal was a sweet, very, very sweet person who loved to make others around him feel good and he was just always happy. His temperament, was was always like, I'm okay. You know, it's always okay. And um, he never, never ever showed uh, any aggression. I've never seen him outwardly angry about anything, um, but I've never seen him completely ecstatic about anything. Jamal was a very quiet child. And many times I felt that he had something to say and would not. We've always known that black men can't cry or black men should just, you know, suck it up or there's no feelings involved. And I believe that what that means for many of us and including my son is that you have to suck it up and swallow it down and put it in a knot in your stomach. I think the biggest issue that we face, particularly minorities, is that it is it comes across as a, a sign of weakness or it comes across as um, complaining or they won't even think that anybody will take them seriously. We're indoctrinated to believe that it's always going to be better. It's going to get better. You, you, you're just not focused or you just need you just need Jesus or you 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 soft you know early on uh, we had to protect 
Jamal in settings. Uh, we would move him to settings where we felt his safety was not uh, going to be an issue uh, because he was picked on and he was bullied from a very young age. He was teased so badly on a field trip. And when he came home, he was so angry and upset. And he told her then, you know, I hate myself. A few years ago, he tried to do the same thing um, in his closet. That's why that's the first place I checked, but he was younger, so he could fit in there. Um, and that was, he used the same karate belt, which is what I know, because I remember that day like it was yesterday. That incident ended up with him going to uh, a setting for children who were disturbed because he tried to kill himself at sixth grade. And then he started counseling. He started counseling as a result of that. I always felt like, well, that's the end of that chapter and, you know, we can move on. I just think that it was the current environment that really uh, made him feel like the world was closing in. This is determined to be an unlawful assembly. You must disperse the area. Officers are being assaulted by members of your group. Black Lives Matter movement and everything is it's put a big magnifying glass on, you know, what the reality is for young black men. And when COVID hit, that changed his whole world because now uh, adult folks, we all got paranoid, right? about the information that we were being given about social distancing and limiting the folks that were coming to your house or weren't, right? And so um, when those things kind of got put in place, all of these kids had to stay wherever they were. I really believe that being in a situation where he couldn't do those social things that made him happy, you know, um, he was in a band, you know, and they, they used to practice in my grandmother's house in the basement and he had friends that, you know, he saw daily. Not being able to do those things, not being able to just have the freedom to go and, and go get a cheeseburger somewhere with some friends, um, I, I'm more than sure that, that that played a role. He was struggling with standards, um, just living up to what he thought he should have lived up and he didn't do that. Um, he was scared about his future. He thought, you know, he didn't have a purpose. The day he actually did it, you could kind of tell he was off and I got like a really like bad feeling and he was just like, um, it's not worth it. Like he just didn't feel like he fit in in this world just because of those situations that he was going through. So it was later, probably like nine or 10, my friend came over and um, I tried to you know, open his door, but it was locked. So she was like, just try to open the door, open the door. So I'm like, okay. So he, he actually came and opened it because he saw me trying to put the knife in to open the door. And um, he was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. I was like, okay, well, we're gonna go to Speedway. Do you want to icy or something? He said, no, but I brought him back one anyway. That's when I kind of started getting ready for bed. But I had such a bad feeling that I couldn't go to bed right away. And he left the house actually around 11 or 12-ish um, to go to his girlfriend's house to talk to her. He came back, I don't know what time, but um, that's when, about the time I woke up and, you know, went to look around the house. So the first place I checked was his room and his closet, of course. I was like, okay, he's not in there. Next place was to check outside to see if the car was there, because I knew he left, but I didn't know he came back. And the car was outside, so I'm like, where could he be? So I checked the basement, because he's usually in the basement. So I, the next place I checked was the garage, because that's where he usually hangs out with his friends. I sat there and I screamed for about five minutes, and I ran, I got the phone, called 911 on the house phone, called my mom and my grandma on the other phone. She found a, a stool to stand on to cut him down, and um, I, when he fell, she ran. Well, Rafi and I, we actually 
had gotten all dressed and was leaving out the door to go to work because um, I have a condo down here in the city, so sometimes we stay in the city and sometimes we stay out in Olympia. It was about 5.50 in the morning. I was on my way to work. I was in a rush because it was the day I had my performance review, so I wanted to be on time. I had picked out my clothes. It was a pink shirt and pink pants, and I was just ready to start the normal work day. So um, we were leaving uh, to go out to work, and Jada called. And she's screaming, and she's hollering, and I can't make sense of what she's saying. And so I hear things that she's saying that means Jamal, 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 or stating his name. So immediately I just said, call the police, call the police. And she said, no, Ma, they're already here. And I got quiet and I kept asking, whoop, whoop. and I, she stopped and said, no, you don't understand, Jamal is dead. And um, everything just went crazy from right there. You know, she said that Jamal had hung himself. I remember screaming. And I hopped in the car, and the car could not go fast enough to get to my home. When we arrived, the police were there, and they basically blocked the entrance in my home to the garage. They said they would not let me in at this time. They were waiting for the coroner. So as they opened the garage door and the coroner came, um, my son was in a body bag. And the policeman said, I can't let you touch him, but I will let you see him. So he unzipped the bag and I saw his face. And it was like uh, the most eerie silence in the world. And I remember just telling myself to breathe. I think I bowed on my, on my knees and said, just breathe. And they zipped him up and put him in the van. So I went in the garage to try to see what I could find out or what had, you know, how could this, how, how? And I couldn't make sense of it. And um, I went deaf. I went deaf. The guilt, the guilt was immediate. It was absolutely immediate because I, all of those what if questions, what could I have said, what could I have done, what, what could have been done better, all of those are rampant and they come, those questions come back to back to back to back to back to back. If, if I did know the reason, it wouldn't make it better. If I did have a note or a recording or some type of note or uh, statement from my son to tell me why. It wouldn't ease my pain. I, I often wondered, uh, did Jamal suffer? Was there any point in his time when he said, I don't want to do this and couldn't get out of it? Was there any moment where he maybe wanted somebody to come rescue him or find him? The whys, the questions, I, I I will never know. You know, when you close your eyes, that's all you see is just your brother hanging from a garage and it's kind of just something you really don't want to think about, but it's a constant nagging thought, you know, in the back of your head every second of the day, even though, you know, you could have a smile on your face, you know, but it's still there. To actually know that uh, this occurred and to have those, those visions, um, it almost brings you back to a uh, slave time. I uh, could not blink without seeing my son hanging from a noose or something like a tree. And the visual of it is very real. 
think me and my child, my daughter, will experience that for the rest of our lives. If I could say anything to him right now, you are so loved and you are, you are so special to everybody who ever met you. And I know we as people don't show it like we're supposed to. I know we as black men are taught not to do it. But I would just hug him and just tell him how much I love him and how much he meant to me. Because I believe he just didn't know. He just didn't know. I'm just so sorry. I'm just so sorry. I am so sorry that he didn't have the uh, ability to speak not a syllable to me or anyone. Um, the, the biggest regret that I have is that he didn't feel that, that, that as many of us that loved him and care for him, um, he didn't feel that. And that, that's, that's the hole in my heart that will never go away, that, that he didn't feel that. I would probably tell him that, you know, there is a purpose to his life, because that's one thing he really struggled with, is finding that purpose. Um, I would tell him that you're only 19, you have a whole life to live, a whole life to get yourself together. You can go back to school, you could get a new job, you know, you could figure out your life. Um, the world didn't end just because, you know, you failed a little bit. You know, that's what I would tell him. Dare to be great. Your mother loves you, your grandfather loves you, your grandparents love you, I love you, your sister loves you, everybody loves you. You know, we've got all kind of resources, whatever you need, let us know. I'm about to tell him I love him. You know, we got a lot of support from us. He could talk to us about anything. We ain't gonna judge you, none of that. You feel me? So, but most definitely, we love you. Keep fighting, and that he had people, a lot of people that loved him and would have been there for him and continue to have been there for him, and that I loved him more than anything. I say to him that I love him more than anybody or thing on this planet and that uh, I miss you every day. And throughout everything, I see all the people that come and congregate in his memory. And I know just not even by talking to him, but looking at them, that's all they would have done too. If I could tell other people like that, I would make sure that they know that there are people that love them. There are ways that you can get support, therapy, hotlines that you can call, that you should never just give up. There's always somebody that really, really loves you. Stay connected to others and to sort of talk about your feelings. Um, a lot of times we don't want to do that for fear of embarrassment or you think you're going through something alone but I think it's important to connect with others and share your feelings, uh, cause you never know the impact you can have on others. Life is difficult in itself. So you don't have to worry about trying to commit suicide cause the clock is already ticking. We're all promised that we're gonna die. So you don't have to rush it. I would say to them that they're not alone. Cause usually people feel very alone. Um, I would tell them that there are other options to getting better. And I would tell them that, you know, just imagine what you're leaving behind when you leave. Because the pain is hard for them, that's why they did it, but the pain will be harder on us because we have to live with it. The conversation needs to be had because there are so many, so many young males, young black males who have suffered trauma early in their life and never ever even talked about it, you know? We are forced to move on, live on, and, and be normal if that's a thing.
and especially in these current times that that's of uncertainty where we as adults don't know how to deal with what's going on. I'm um, just being really mindful that our babies are still developing, even our young adults and um, young men and young women are still developing and still trying to navigate through the world. Relationships are everything. If somebody does not feel like you care, it does not matter what comes out of your mouth. If they don't feel it, it doesn't matter what they hear. So the biggest thing that I can tell adults is make sure that you create that relationship and that children feel like you care, because once they feel like you care, then they're more apt to listen to you. So it's not just telling them I'm here, but showing them that you're, that you're there as well. Because it's those children who we think have it all together. Uh, for me, walking away from this will be not to ignore those children or not to have in my mind that they're okay because that's what typically happens. You know, they, everything looks good when you talk to them, everything seems good, and you just feel like they have it all together and those may not be the ones that we will keep coming to saying, hey, I'm here. We only do that when we feel like something's wrong. So for me, going forward, and working with youth, it's just not just focusing on those that I vividly or visually see have an issue, but just making sure everybody gets the same message. Even that kid like Jamal that's always happy and whatever you need, like just making sure that that conversation is, I'm here, you know, just, just a reminder, you need somebody to talk to, just that, con that constant check-in um, is what I think we need to do for those that have it together. This is a club that no mother wants to ever be a part of, has ever asked to know about, and wants no association to be in because it's a lifelong commitment to grieve. My son was in the storm May 27th, 2020, and he didn't get out to see the sun. Remember playing karate man in your mama yard. You was only six, block punch and kicks. We was only playing eyes, trying to make you hard. Heard about them kids at your school starting shit, but that wasn't your mix. You'd rather kill them with kindness. Wasn't looking for trouble when others was trying to find it. Just a gentle giant, never ever defiant. Always ever so humble, relying and compliant. Speaking which I'm reminded, Martin Malcolm and likeness. Malcolm like an intelligence, Martin for non-violent. It worried your grandmother, cause you was always so quiet. But fools know by a speech wise, man by his side. Moved in with Granny Charles, didn't know what to say to you. But I was there every day to get you from Arcadia. Tiff was your teacher, she said she would wave at you. Bobo kids there too, they said they would play with you. You know Charles suffered from cancer and Grant took it badly. He filled in the gap that was vacant from your daddy. When he passed, it had me. No more pipe and caddy. Jada broke my heart, said I miss my granddaddy. Lived with you for a second, took the basement at your spot. When I broke up with Jamie at the telephone, he dropped. First you were scared to fight, but then you played with him a lot. Asking me, Uncle Lynn, can we walk him down the block? I picked you up from school, knew the teachers and the others. Didn't tell your moms, but I stopped the Pero brothers. You just wanted fries. Jada wanted her mother, then she wanted fries. Mom. Can I get another? I put y'all in my video and everybody loved it. Your mama was surprised. You ain't skip a beat of stutter. We could have lit the room with her smile. She was proud like, wow, my baby's as natural as like my brother. I'm a real
really miss you don't know what to say wishing i was with you wishing i could get you for one more day there's a couple more things that i'd like to say you know your uncle love you though he acts so tough gotta live knowing i ain't really hug you enough i hardly call you back and i'm whack for that but ma i really never want to bug you with stuff bro pull up your pants laugh whenever you can and if you get a chance don't be afraid of your stance people gon' glance but gone and still dance make sure you got a lady that got you 50 grand i really hate we didn't connect more okay you really beat me that day connect for respect you get more neglect i stress for electric personality i can't forget boy wish you could have played on this beat i made prodigy on piano bass tenor soprano wish i could have stayed when grand passed away to let you vent and ramble get you a better handle now i'm all scrambled from pictures on the mantle see your door open wishing praying and hoping you gonna walk out giggling and joking but the shadow in your room from the light on the candle jada doing better mall and so is your mother grand coming along bro she know that you love her papa miss you dearly we all do sincerely i'm speaking this to you because i know you can hear and anyone who hear this with a child at risk they new mission in life should be getting them a fix suicide on the rise for our young black kids generational stress for life how it is living as a black man we at war from within if the government don't kill us it's the color of our skin not the color of our skin it's the color of our friends with the bandana do rag sag and the Tims. and if it ain't the Tims, it's the education i wish they understood what we be facing guns thugs drugs life on probation child support traffic court no conversation i love you mom